you could tell that the guys here had uh, definitely a special bond. We win and we lose together as a group. When you're a family and you're brothers and you're all pulling in the same direction, teams like this win. Guys care more about their teams than they do about themselves. That's why this sport and this trophy is so hard to win and why this sport is so beautiful to watch. The one defining moment that was almost perfect was this from Max Talbot. And all of a sudden, lightning strikes. Unbelievable! Ovechkin is just out of this world, and then Sid goes into another stratosphere. I don't know if you'll ever see that again. That's exactly what we needed. That guy in that breakaway and that save from our goalie. Evgeny Malkin out of nowhere! He couldn't be stopped. He had it in his head that he was going to dominate, and that's exactly what he did. So tie this up. It was our turn to try and return the favor, and uh, guys were hungry. None of it matters anymore except this one game. I don't think any guys slept that day. I got a text from Mario, play without fear, and they'll meet you at center ice. seconds to go. Trying to get a late shot. Back Backhander. Stop by Osgood. And time runs out. The Red Wings have won the cup. I wanted to make sure we left everything out there on the ice and you know, see what would happen. And uh, we got a chance to just get it. Looking back on it, I think now you, you try to learn as much as you can because you didn't win. I think that's typical in any scenario. I think the basic, big experience we'll take from that is, you know, the fact of going through each round the way we did and, you know, how bad it is to get that far and lose. I don't think any guy wants to go through that again, so hopefully we'll get another opportunity to go through it and uh, we'll know what it feels like and, and I won't have that happen again. The loss to the Red Wings strengthened Pittsburgh's desire for a championship. The Penguins were hungry heading into the new season, but they would have a very different look. I think the Penguin management had hoped to sign Hosa and have him part of uh, uh, the scenario for a long time, but uh, when it got down to the very end and he departed in such, an, such a quick manner, it caught everybody by surprise. Losing Marion Hosa took skill out of the lineup, but when native son Ryan Malone departed, the team lost a chunk of its heart and soul. This is a guy who was a Pittsburgh born and bred guy who just loved playing at the building where his dad once played, playing amongst family and friends every night, having gone to the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, I don't think he was someone you could replace. He was the last guy to get out of uniform after the Penguins lost game six at Mellon Arena. And uh, that one hurt. I think in some sense, it may have hurt a little bit more than losing Hosa. Another painful loss came in the preseason opener when defenseman Sergei Gonchar suffered a shoulder injury. I think the Penguins were missing someone who ran the power play that was so powerful and, and, and did so much damage. To lose him in the preseason was kind of like the first blow, but again, there was no real like, okay, we're in trouble, we'll find a, you know, we're gonna find a way to get by. In late September, the new look Penguins left for Sweden to start the season. So the NHL's premier weekend in Stockholm is underway. Malkin coming to the net, walks in with a backhander. He shoots and scores! 25 to go in overtime. Kennedy shoots and scores! From the left wing side, beats Gerber like a redded mule. And the Penguins have won it here in overtime. The trip to Europe produced the Penguins' first win and allowed plenty of time for teammates to bond away from the rink. It was a good time to get together as a team. Uh, Anytime you go through something like that, you learn about your teammates, and you know, I think it was a good, a good time for us. Hey all. It was a lot of fun. It was uh, good to uh, get to know each other and just get, get used to it and um, form that bond for the long, long season. It says, uh, it says, find out what the largest animal is in Sweden, and then at the bottom it says, get a picture with the moose. <laughs> I think starting in Sweden was uh, 
pretty good for for, get, for getting everyone uh, acclimated to the team. It was only two games, but I think we went there for, for nine or ten days, which was good. And we had a good start to the season, and I think all the new guys uh, blended in pretty nicely right from the start. The strength of that chemistry would soon be tested. In early November, the Penguins met a rival and his new team in a nationally televised Stanley Cup rematch. Despite holding an early lead, the Penguins went into the third period down two goals. Pittsburgh refused to back down. Malkin fires, stop, rebound in front, Stahl got the hat-trick, Jordan Stahl got the hat-trick, Penguins have tied the game at six, how about those apples, Stahl's got it again from center ice, he has a man fit a tinkle, he fires, he shoots and scores, Bruce Law and fit a tinkle, wins it for the Penguins in overtime, and ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has just left the building. The win powered a 12-4 and 3 start. However, the streak went cold in December. A shutout in New York kept a five-game losing streak. And on January 5th, Pittsburgh was out of the playoff picture. Pittsburgh, in the midst of a losing stretch, likes of which they have not seen in quite some time. Well, looking back on it, I, mean, I don't know if it was fatigue from uh, maybe from last uh, season going so long or, or maybe that that trip to Sweden and, and the way the league works now, there's just not an easy game anymore. Um, you look at the standings every day and uh, everyone's so tight and uh, everyone's so competitive. I think that had a lot to do with it too. The Penguins aren't scoring and their mega stars are caught in the drought. The Penguins got to find some goals, Bob, and then they might find some wins. It was a tough time. You know, you, uh, like I said, we, we lost, we're two games away from winning it and uh, you're going to, uh, I don't I think we're like 10th or 11th place uh, out of playoffs. So. Uh, Things were pretty, were pretty bad, actually. You've got adversity staring you right in the face, basically, is what it comes down to, and this Penguin team is determined to respond to it in the right way. It's just a matter of whether or not they can actually do it. You know, there was just uh, a lot of things that probably swayed our focus from the start of the season, and we didn't get the, the right start, but I think it was just a number of things, and for whatever reason, we couldn't get our game in order. And then you start to lose confidence when you start to lose games, and then that doesn't bring a good feeling to the rink, and it's hard to kind of get out of that rut. By mid-February, Pittsburgh hit bottom. The Penguins fell to 10th in the Eastern Conference and set five points out of the playoffs. The silver lining was that after missing half the season, Sergei Gonchar was back. Well, no more excuses for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Finally, Sergei Gonchar is back tonight, and they're five points out of a playoff spot with 26 to go. You know, it was really tough for me sitting out there and you know watching those games and you know, not being able to help. As good as uh, Evgeny Malkin was back on the play on the power play, as good as uh, Chris Letang was, there's just nobody that could replace the calmness, the coolness, uh, the control that Sergei Gonchar brought to the power play. Gonchar through the screen and it scores! He's the heart and soul of our defense. He, he plays in every situation. He plays in tough minutes, power play, penalty kill, plays against other teams' top lines. You know, anytime you can get a guy like Gonch back in your lineup, it's it's only going to help. Sergei Gonchar with a bullet. He returned February 14th in Toronto and helped the Pens take a 2-1 lead into the third period. But in a span of 19 seconds, the course of their season was altered. Jason Blake scores! Here's Dominic Moore looking for another one. Blake again scores! You know you're in trouble when they're still announcing one goal. And the next one goes in. Toronto has the lead. Here's Kroger to Mitchell. He scores. That stage and trailing in. Drop past stage and scores. And now the Maple Leafs are ahead 6-2. to two. This will be an awful loss for the Penguins. Hard to believe how quickly this game turned around for them. I think we got to about the middle of February there, and just the overall team confidence was really low. Just kind of approaching games not to lose it rather than going out there being aggressive and trying to win games. The Valentine's Day loss in Toronto would be Michelle Terrian's last behind the bench. The next day, he was removed as head coach. There was just something with the team, the way we were playing, that I didn't like at the end, and, and I take responsibility in that as well. I had to do what I could at that point in time to try to fix it. You know what they say, you can't change 23 players, so it's a lot easier to change one. We uh, weren't playing well at all at that point in the season, and uh, I mean, we, we needed something to spark us if, if we were going to make the playoffs. 
There he is, Dan Bilesma. He's the youngest man behind the bench. At that point in time, I thought we needed someone that really knew our players, had the personality of a Dan Bilesma. The one thing in the back of my mind was, he had always, even though he'd only coached 50-some games in the American Hockey League as a head coach, he had played over 400 as a player. He knew the psyche of the players. He was a great person one-on-one, -on -one, great communication skills, the energy. And, you know, I look back, one of Dan's favorite sayings I find out is, why not? So, why not? A new man still wondering if, is this all true? I'm here in the National Hockey League. What a day for Dan Bilesma. Coach Bilesma brought in a, a new attitude, a, a fresh, positive look, and uh, I think everybody just jumped on the opportunity. And the Patriots have won for the first time under Dan Bilesma. And obviously, when Dan came in, the attitude changed. He, you know, made a couple of trades. Bilesma's aggressive style turned the Penguins loose, and the addition of two veterans at the trade deadline gave them everything they lacked. We needed to be a gritty, uh, tough team to play against, an in-your-face type of team, and Chris Kunitz is all that and more. Chris Kunitz with the hat trick! Coming from a, uh, a team he won a championship with, he also knew what it took in that regard. And then Billy Guerin, you know, there, there can be a lot said for what he did on the ice, but off the ice, it's where this guy really showed our guys where you can have fun, you can be serious, you can joke around, but you can also be 38 years and wanting to get better at your game. Walks in, shoots, go! We have our young superstars here. You know, we, we've got Sid, we have Gino, we have Stalzy. So there wasn't a, a ton of pressure on me, like, like playing-wise, but it, just to come in and be myself and, and to offer something, you know, with my experience, I guess it's another way of just saying old. You know, I was fortunate enough to be put on a line with Sid right away, and, um, you know, he definitely makes things easier out on the ice. So it, it was great. It was a good situation to come into. Because they're good people, because of the group of guys we had, we were able to, to make that adjustment pretty quickly, and um, it was very important for us getting into the playoffs. With only 21 games left in the regular season, every game is a must-win for the Penguins. Evgeny Malkin, a one-timer with a power play goal in OT. Yeah, that one road trip started in Chicago. I think we ended in Washington. Uh, I went 5-0 and on the road trip. That was that was definitely the turning point in the season. Alex Ovechkin fired. Flurry makes the pad save. And Pittsburgh has the best five-game road trip in its history. When we came in on February 15 and then really the main focus was not necessarily changing the system but getting the mindset to be more aggressive and force teams to deal with our skill and our speed. The amazing part is the guys in that room uh, bought in so quickly. It started making sense on the ice for our team and, and thankfully it made sense in the scoreboard as well. Hey, stars. The Penguins are, are, are rising like stars as they are only one point out of a playoff spot in the Eastern Conference. That was really the basis of, uh, of our season to really jump step us uh, in, into a playoff position and move forward from there. Pittsburgh won 18 of their last 25 games. They clinched the playoffs with a win on April 7th, earning the right to another run at the Stanley Cup. This is the Penguin team that everybody saw last year, the Never Say Die Penguins, and they've done it again. The playoffs were next, and a familiar rival was waiting. You can go back to the 80s, and you're going to find that rivalry is great a rivalry in probably all sports, not just hockey. You know, there's some history there, and the guys didn't like each other too much. And you go back to last year, when we knocked the Flyers out in the conference finals, we, we kind of shattered their dreams. We know they were going to be physical. We know they were going to come hard at us. These teams have really developed a genuine hate for each other. And the Battle of Pennsylvania is about to begin. As expected, the state rivals were physical from the opening faceoff. But Pittsburgh took the early advantage on the scoreboard. Here's a loose puck in front of your own open net score! What a save there by Mark Andre Fleury. Backhand pass off the stick of the first turn. Oh! What a save! What a stop here by Mark Andre Fleury! He's one of those guys that uh, you, you think you haven't beat, but uh, he never quits on any pucks. Hands it off down low for Garrett. Garrett, just go! Billy Garrett! The Penguins win 3-2. They lead the series two games in a...
playing in that building is a tough place to play, and they certainly don't like some of our guys very much. They like to dislike you here. How do you overcome that? Well, it's been like that for, for a few years now. It doesn't change. It maybe escalates a bit in the playoffs. The fans were not alone in offering the Penguins a rude welcome to Philadelphia. The Flyers dominated game three. Yeah, well, they're playing hard, hard against us. They're having a good team. Uh, they, they compete to the last second. Threw an awful game out there in game three and uh, didn't, didn't really want to come back here tied 2-2. Comes Kuna, Kuna tries to slide it across, the flex, it's in the net. Kills up to the here's Cook, sets it up for Cam Kennedy, back in, score! Tyler Kennedy! He has been the difference maker in this period for his team. Slapper and a big club save again by Flurry. Sets it across, Richards, a shot saved by Flurry. He played unbelievable that game. Loose puck, Flurry diving, he's got the puck. We know we have him back there and it, you know, it brings confidence to the team. Here's Richards with a drive miss to that is opportunity. Flurry able to rob Briere. Old tending clinic here by Mark Andre Flurry. After you win the first two games, you feel like you have a real opportunity to take a you know a grasp on the series. And Flower gave us that opportunity in game four with, with that performance. Here's Carter now beats it on the right side. Now John Drew with a drive and a save by Flurry. A huge win and a major disappointment as the Philadelphia Flyers put 46 shots on that man, Mark Andre Fleury. We stole that one, or he he stole that one. I mean, we probably had no business winning that game. Backed by Marty Baron's shutout, the Flyers proved the series was far from over. Right, he scores! Back to the front of the net, gets it, score! Mike Canubo makes it three to nothing. Game six was back in Philadelphia. Win the game, you go back to Pittsburgh. That's what Philly was looking at. Game six, Penguins and the Flyers. I remember the first period, um, I did a turnover, which caused the first goal. Down by Hawk and then steered on back. Oh, oh, and I felt so bad. I was like, oh my God. And then, then he scored another one, another one. I'm like, oh. Yeah, I think being down 3-0 uh, game six in Philly, we were uh, a little bit in trouble. I knew that I was not going to score three goals that game, so I decided to do something else. Oh, he's a snap in front of here. Tarsillo and Talbot. I asked Cars, which I know because we, we played uh, together in Wilkes-Barre. So and I knew he, was, he, he would not refuse. I understand why Max Talbot is fighting here, but if you're Dan Carcillo, there's really no reason to engage. You have all the momentum. You're up 3 nothing a game. There is a time. There is a place. I didn't win the fight, but uh, I don't think anyone really cared about that. The one defining moment that was almost perfect was this from Max Talbot. I think what that brought is just a guy who's saying, you know what, you know, we're going to keep battling here, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Every winning team, a cup team, is out of Max Talbot. I'm not sure he quieted the fans with that fight, but what happened after that certainly did. Walking out in front, trying to slam one home, reaching out and doing a squid dash. He tried to get us some momentum, and you know, really, he did a great job of that, and, and we bounced back. I was lucky enough that my teammate responded with you know, a couple goals right after. I still can't believe what transpired there. We played on another level, and we found a way to get that. That was a big win. They are a, a, a real worthy opponent. For the Penguins to beat them, uh, as they did in that opening round, I think it instilled even more confidence in them as they went along. The change of momentum in that second period when the Flyers go home and the Penguins go on. Galvanized by the Battle of Pennsylvania, the Penguins trained their sights on another rival in the conference semifinals.
with their own corps of young guns and an explosive attack led by the indomitable Alex Ovechkin, the Washington Capitals figured to be a formidable foe. At the heart of the electricity, the hockey world focused on the battle between the game's two signature stars. There was so much talk about this series being Sidney Crosby versus Alexander Ovechkin. And I guess it goes back to the first season after the lockout, where there was so much hope about Crosby and Ovechkin carrying the league. Well, now this was the matchup that everybody wanted to see. It didn't matter what round of the playoffs. They wanted to see these two guys go at it. The playoffs are an intense atmosphere as it is, but uh, this adds more to it for sure. It's a rivalry, and, and that's uh, that's enough to say about it. It was, as Bruce Boudreau put so eloquently, a circus-type atmosphere, and uh, it certainly was. Thanks to brilliant play in net, Washington took game one and an early series lead. Crosby and Ovechkin both scored. But it was just the beginning of their titanic clash. Their best tricks were yet to come. Sid was quietly motivated by that series and playing against Alexander Ovechkin. He didn't come out in the media and talk a lot about it, but you knew he was quite driven, and he wanted, at the end of the day, for Ovechkin to come shake his hand at the end of that series. There are games that you see and games that you broadcast uh, that just take your breath away. And I'm sure it's the same way with a fan watching games. Well, I personally had never been around, you know, a playoff series uh, with, with such hype, with the two superstars going at it. So for me, it was pretty amazing. Ovechkin one on one against Sergei Gonchor, cutting it, fire, he scores! And the Capitals have a 4 2 lead! Sick game, sick three goals by uh, me and him. If I was Capitals fans, uh, I was very, I would be very happy right now. I don't know if you ever see that again. Uh, two special players doing it on one special night. A lot of times you see games like that or a series like that when there isn't the end result of all the build-up, but really there was. If you hate to waste a hat trick performance, you know, Sid played a great game and unfortunately we weren't, weren't able to win, but uh, even after we, we came back home down 0-2, we, we still had a, a, a positive feel. We knew it was far from over. The roller coaster continued in Pittsburgh for game three, where the bounces went both ways. Sleeping Giants awoke. Oh, make me a milkshake, Morgan. No lead was safe. And the Capitals draw even late in the third. And three periods weren't enough. Being down 2-0, you don't want to lose that game. And uh, winning in overtime obviously can you know, give you a boost. And we needed a boost at that time. There's no way we, could, we couldn't afford to lose that game. An unsung hero stepped forward to give Pittsburgh the lift they desperately needed. It was a face-off play. We, we work at it during uh, all, every, pretty much every practice. And uh, you just, like, win the draw. And uh, the puck is coming, like, on the wall. The demon take it. It was Mark Eden at that time. And pass it to me. I just tried to shoot on that. Take shot, score! It was an unbelievable feeling. Every night, like, the game's going to OT, you want to be the hero, and you want to be the guy who's going to make your team win. And it was probably my most important goal I never scored in my life, and I'm glad I did it. 
The capitals were unshaken by Latang's rocket, but the penguins carried all the momentum into game four. They were explosive crew, uh, a lot of firepower offensively. It was, it was really intense, and, and we knew it. Better Tinkle takes over. He comes into the camp's end. We see one off the ball. And the net it goes. All over but the shouting. Let's hear some of that. I think it was probably one of the most exciting series that people got to watch. had a bunch of young superstars who were really, really going at it. Goal line, back for return, he scores! Well, a lot of uh, back and forth offense, and, you know, again, uh, our superstars uh, really stepped up and, uh, and did the job. With the ball, good late rush, coming on the power play, the Cavs hit. In front, of the goal. With three straight victories, the Penguins were one win from the conference final. An opportunity to close out the series at home slipped away on David Steckel's overtime winner. The final score, the Capitals 5 and the Penguins 4, and there will be a Game 7 at Verizon Center. I was walking out of the pregame skate with uh, Mark Eaton, and all those games in that series had been really close, you know, nail, nail biters. And, and I turned to him and I said, would it be too much to ask for for a blowout tonight? And we kind of laughed about it. We're like, yeah, you know, just something where we don't have to, you know, take it right down to the wire. It turned the whole tide. It took the air out of the balloon. It was just this sense of shock in the building, like, whoa, this isn't supposed to happen to us. This isn't how it's supposed to be. Our best player against their stellar goaltender, that's supposed to be in the back of the net. How does he make that glove save? And it's almost like time stood still, and the Penguins built off of that, and then the, the Capitals, they never recovered. Here's Crosby taking it down the right wing to the Capitals zone. Breaks on, looking for a trailer. has got him again. Slaps on, he shoots and scores. Chris Letang makes it 4 to nothing. He shoots and scores. Jordan gets the fast lead. Grandma, the bingo game, is ready to roll. Final score of the game, 6-2 to two Penguins. They win game 7. They gather around Mark andre Fleury. They have survived this one very capably tonight. The Penguins had to really, really reach back to win that series, and they had to do it uh, in a seventh game on the road, and they came out with their best hockey to win it. So it kind of started the motor, if you will, even more to them believing that they had a chance to win the Stanley Cup. Following an epic series, the Pens were back in the conference final. This time, they faced Carolina, a team riding the momentum of a pair of Game 7s of their own. First against New Jersey, and then top-seeded Boston. Battle lines were drawn. It was brother against brother. But one man was focused on dominating as the stakes got higher. Well, what Malkin was able to do in that series, that's one that stays in your memory banks. Goes to Malkin, backhand shot. Hey! All the naysayers, all the doubters were all knocking on Gino's door, and uh, he opened it, he kicked it wide open. Kennedy comes out of front, Now Malkin picks it up, he fell that puck, he drilled him behind board, Evgeny Malkin out of nowhere. He was so good in that series, he kind of just took control. What's he going to do with it? Shoot it towards the net, off the pad, rebound, Malkin, hey! in the crowd from mom and dad he's had quite a game tonight again i think it's used to have your parents around them for him it's been uh, it's hard to it's a, there's a big language barrier and uh, being with his parents i think it helped him uh, a lot this year we know that the son is a rock star in pittsburgh pa but the mom and dad are 
gaining fan support. Evgeny Malkin having a monster night. The backhand goal off the faceoff was just one of those moments in the playoffs that you'll always remember. Here's Malkin behind the goal. Turns around, comes out, backhand shot. I remember where I was in 71 when Jock Lemaire scored on Tony Esposito. I remember being in uh, Pittsburgh in 1991 with Mario Lemieux putting on an unbelievable display. You remember these magical moments. In that game, he took the series over for us, and that was uh, all Gino. He was happy-go-lucky. Uh, I think he loved having his parents in the stands. Uh, he was doing interviews. Your mom and dad have become almost as famous as you are here in Pittsburgh. What's it like to have them here to enjoy all of this with you? Yeah, I enjoy it because my mom is good food. It's cooking. It's before game, I'm good food, and I'm my feelings is good. I haven't had his mom's food. I've been begging him to go over to his house now because he always talks about how good his mom's cooking is. Balkan's got the puck. He goes right to the net. Comes in, scores. On the short side, he beats Ward. Evgeny Malkin just with an explosion of speed to go to the net and score. You know, it got to the point where, you know, maybe they didn't feel like they could stop him. He couldn't be stopped. He couldn't be stopped. He had it in his head that he was going to dominate, and, and that's exactly what he did. We got to play off, so we had meetings, and... Um, Everyone kind of had to tell each other what they were going to provide the team, and he said uh, he said he was going to carry us to the Stanley Cup. So, and uh, he said it in broken English. Guys kind of got a laugh out of it, but you could tell he was really serious. He took it upon himself. Anybody uh, that, that has the competitive nature that he does wants to wants to bounce back and and prove everybody wrong, and uh, you know that that's exactly what he did. All hail of Genny Malkin. Bolstered by Malkin's heroics, Pittsburgh swept past the Hurricanes. They now stood four wins from the Stanley Cup. And it's over. The Pittsburgh Penguins have defeated the Carolina Hurricanes 4-1. to one. And you can spit sign your shoes, Mabel. It's time to dance with Lord Stanley. Once again, the Penguins go to the Stanley Cup Finals. Five seconds to go. Penguins move back in. Two seconds to go. One last shot. Save! And the rebound went wide. It's over. The Detroit Red Wings win the Stanley Cup. They are mobbing Chris Osgood. And the Red Wings are Stanley Cup champions. Last year, they thought they were ready, but they really weren't ready. The pain of going through the final last year, losing game six at home. Excellent series, Sid. Good job. The Penguins went through it. They felt that pain. It's something that you want to forget, but actually it's, it's healthy to remember it because you can use it as motivation. You talked a little bit about an emotional experience losing the cup was for you. Um, yeah, I know it was tough. I mean, it's it's difficult for everyone, and you dream your whole life about being in that position, and you work so hard, and um, right at that moment, you never know if you're going to get another chance. Uh, regrets, uh, not at all. You know, I'm got the chance to you know go to the finals uh, and win the cup. Right. Can you talk a little bit about Dan and, and I guess obviously how you think he's done so far? <laughs> how have you done so far? <laughs> Be kind. <laughs> you know, he's made this, for me, the last three months have been my most enjoyable three months as a manager, quite honestly. It's fun to come to the rink every day with this group of guys and the players, and um, so I think he's done a fantastic job. When you bought the team, did you ever imagine it getting to this level consistently? Well, that was certainly a goal of mine when I bought the team to hopefully one day win the Stanley Cup. And uh, we had an opportunity last year that uh, uh, didn't go as planned, but uh, hopefully this year the outcome's going to be different. 
Get a good ski and warm up, boys. Get a good ski. Push it out, push it out. Get the legs going, a little lather. Loosen up. Loose and flying, loose and flying, boys. Here we go, boys. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. rare to have back-to-back -back finalists come back together 25 years ago it was the islanders in edmonton that did it i was so happy when when they beat it chicago because i wanted to play them and i remember uh, just cheering for detroit for one game in the 2009 cup final is underway the penguins played with an edge as the rematch began they were electrified by one emotion we wanted some vengeance i mean they they handed it to us the previous year for the Pittsburgh Penguins this year, not so much. You can see they're playing with boys. They're comfortable in the theater. It felt a lot different. You know, we knew exactly what to expect. We knew uh, our opponents so much more. Let's go. You made two scrums. You've been involved in a beating. I know. So move. We're not doing that. We felt like we could, you know, attack more and, and create more speed and force them on their heels a bit more, which would take away from their game. Pittsburgh created plenty of scoring chances, but their sharpshooters were unable to capitalize. Malkin's going to have a breakaway from center ice. Malkin in on Oscar, shoots and a save by Oscar. Crosby picks, does the spin around on the backhand, stopped by Oscar. Always money in the playoffs, goalie Chris Osgood was at the top of his game in his quest for another Stanley Cup. Osgood played well in their building, and uh, I think just little bounces didn't really help us. The Red Wings strike on a play they've used against so many teams off the end boards and in. They would score a goal, you know, in and around our net off a rebound or off the end boards. Getting goals off a pair of fortunate bounces, Detroit picked right up where they left off last year against the Penguins. Boards matter, you know, hockey's the only sport without out of bounds. And the boards in Detroit changed the whole complexion of the game. And if you're not comfortable playing in that environment, your chances of winning aren't very good. And so I think in the case of Pittsburgh, they weren't very comfortable playing with those boards in game number one, especially Marc-Andre Fleury. It was a big problem for him. Just like last year, but not quite as easily, Red Wings win game one. We don't have to change a whole lot, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, played some pretty good hockey. Um, came down to bounce, but uh, we did a great job of generating some good quality chances just in going. The Penguins stayed loose heading into game two. They were committed to maintaining pressure on Osgood and the Wings. We got to them, we got scoring chances like other teams couldn't, but we still, we needed to do it better. start to this game tonight this is a must-win game for Pittsburgh so let's just say it's really really important that the Pittsburgh Penguins even this up tonight if they want to win the Stanley Cup away from the swirling Zetterberg it's a drive that is blocked on by Oscar Pittsburgh clung to an early lead, but they were wary of Detroit's relentless counterattacks. We were getting to our game at the time, they would punch back. They would uh, push the play back at us. They would get to their games. We would try to get it back. Uh, they would score a goal. With Detroit star Pavel Datsuk out since the conference final, the Wings looked to their role players to fill the void. They responded with three goals and pushed the pens to their breaking point. It's a pass from Shatan just out of his reach. He turns and fires. Centerberg is there again. Turned it over. Malkin shot. Osgood makes the save. And he got a little push at the side of the net. And that causes this. Hey, Malkin trying to get after Zetterberg. He's throwing haymakers and Henrik Centerberg. 
played pretty well, and a couple of things didn't go our way. And at the end of that game, we we, we got frustrated, but uh, I think we did it the right way and and showed that we're not going to back down. Malkin, who led the league in scoring during the regular season, proved he could play with an edge. He escaped without suspension and was in uniform for a critical game three in Pittsburgh. If you look at it, if you really, really look at it, there was no message sending. There was no uh, uh, goonism. And it was just two great players with an outpouring of emotion. There was nothing more than that. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got injured. No blood. No foul. I thought the NHL was right on on the call. Stanley Cup Final Series shifts to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Mellon Arena, home of the Pittsburgh Penguins. The fans here in Pittsburgh have not seen a championship team in 17 years when Mario Lemieux led the Pens to consecutive Stanley Cups back in 1991 and 1992. Returning home, where they won 15 of their last 19 playoff games, the Penguins arrived ready for work. They had a loyal crowd behind them as they look to avoid falling behind three games to none. Well, as you can see, most of the fans here are dressed in white T-shirts. They are waving white towels. Quite a scene here at Mellon Arena. Well, the Wings took a 2-0 lead into Pittsburgh, but I don't think anybody thought it was a commanding 2-0 lead. We had been in that situation in Washington going down 2-0, and it was very similar. We thought we'd played two good games and good enough to win, and it didn't happen. We just stuck with things as we were in Washington and believed in the way we played. Going down 2-0 to anyone's a daunting challenge, but against the Red Wings, it's probably even tougher. And I thought our team did a really good job of just staying focused, blocking all that out. And we knew if we came back here and just one or two home games, we'd be all right. Game three is underway. Ultra takes a huge hit there for Matt Cook. Matt Cook has had a couple of big hits to start this game. Pittsburgh came flying out the first five to ten minutes, scored the first goal. Al Malkin sets it up, a tip, score! Maxime Talbot! That would normally stagger a team that had a 2-0 lead, could probably relax, but the Wings bounced right back. Now picked up by Swanson, sends it back in deep lane, walks right out of front, save, rebound, tip, score! Henrik Zetterberg! Snaps it by Mark andre Fleury, and the Red Wings have responded to tie this game at one. The fact that the Red Wings immediately tied it right away, which is, again, yeah, no, that's, that's so Detroit, right? I mean, you don't get to enjoy things very long when you're playing against the Detroit Red Wings. That goal is huge for Detroit because this place got very quiet. Red Wings trying to keep the pressure out here. Orpik takes Fleury down away from the puck, and that is going to be called. Going to be a power play coming here to Detroit. You just don't want to give Detroit too many power play opportunities. Henrik Zetterberg again. Let one across. Score! Left it up high on the cross ice pass. And with that one is Johan Bronson, his 12th of the playoffs. Again, this building was just buzzing the first 10 minutes of the game. And now it's been quiet because Detroit has responded with two goals. Momentum was in Detroit's favor until the Penguins finally got the break they desperately needed. Pittsburgh has too many men on the ice. You're right. Pittsburgh has too many men on the ice. A goalie in six. I can't believe Detroit doesn't know this. Billy Guerin was on the bench saying, we got too many men on the ice. We got too many men on the ice. And you don't want to yell in those situations and alert the referee or alert the other team. And so we casually tried to call off a player. It was at least 20 to 25 seconds. There were six players on the ice for the Pittsburgh Penguins. The only permissible sixth skater in game three would have been the crowd at Mellon Arena. You're not actually allowed another guy on the ice. But Pittsburgh got away with it. Yeah, we deserve that. I mean, you know, after the bounces we got the first couple games, things kind of evened out eventually. You don't see that happen ever, but... Um, no, we're real happy we got away with it. Sends it across. It got through to Latang. Gets the shot. He scores! Chris Latang has tied the game at two on the power play.
With the score tied after a wild opening period, the champs came out with purpose, still looking to take a stranglehold on the series. And it's picked up by Samuelson. He may get a break here. Samuelson cuts in. He took the hit the goal post. Now it comes back in front for Cromwell with a drive. Save made in the puck in front of an open net. Here's Zetterberg handing it off. Looks for the return. Right on him. And save made by Mark andre Fleury. Second period, we, we were not really good. We were not playing our game, and Flowers stood up. Back the other way comes Applicator. Applicator top of the circle with a drive and a save made. Opala drops it back down. Here's Cromwell. Winds up with traffic in front. Redirected right on the save. Loose puck. Orphan may have made a stop. That might have been the Wings' best period of the entire finals. Mark andre Fleury, by far the busier of the two goaltenders. He faced 14 shots. I think Pittsburgh has to feel pretty good about coming out of this period tied going into the third period because this was a period in which Detroit really dominated. I think then the odds shifted towards the home team. Here we go, Fox. Here we go. Central. Here we go. A Detroit win tonight. They take a commanding 3 0 lead. A Pittsburgh win, and the series is 2 1 heading into game four here on Thursday night. Boy, it wasn't like last year where we kind of knew they were a lot better than us. We never got too high or too low. We play really well in front of our own crowd, and I think we build off our crowd, which is huge. Tyler Kennedy has it there for Stahl, a drive save. Loose puck, another stop by Osgood. Detroit still does not have a shot on goal in this third period. Matt Cook bumped off a little bit by Erickson. There'll be a penalty coming up to Detroit. A power play for Pittsburgh, and now you, you can hear the buzz in this building. In a 2-2 game, 10.54 to go. Kelly Killers are very tired. They haven't been able to change for Detroit. Now it comes back straight away. Gotcha, another bus go! Power play goal for Pittsburgh, and they have taken the lead at 3-2. That was just hold and serve. When we uh, came back home, we knew we had to take care of business. Going to be a, uh, it was going to be a quick series if we lost one here. They are looking to even this series up, Joe. And, of course, a win here guarantees a game six back in this building. The game four, I think, was the game that changed a lot because it changed the script from last year. Up to that point, everything was the same. The way they wanted to change the script was make it 2-2. Two -two. Malkin's goal gave Pittsburgh an early lead, and the Penguins pounded Detroit's veterans with a barrage of crackling hits. But the Wings had young legs of their own, and they were just as hungry as the home team. Eric will come out and give Detroit a short power play, a steal by Helm, and he scores! Darren Helm! And the Red Wings have tied this game four and one apiece. Now sends it out to Stewart. Brad Stewart with a try score! Mark andre Fleury could not see this blast by Brad Stewart. With the Penguins parading to the penalty box, it seemed like history was destined to repeat itself. There's a trip from Torpik. It's going to go off. Torpik to Bilkina. He's angry about it. He'll argue it with two seconds left in the Malkin penalty. The Penguins are in penalty trouble again. The Red Wings' power play smelled blood, but Pittsburgh's youngest player was about to end a seven-game scoring drought. Eaton reversed it on. Talbot outlets. Jordan Stahl carries. Rapalski back with him. Stahl in front. Stahl! Just a team like Detroit, they don't give up shorthanded goals. So that was, that was huge. I was probably the most relieved person in the building because I was the one in the penalty box. The questions were, when is Jordan Stahl going to start scoring? How about game four? It's probably the biggest goal he had ever scored in his life. And to do it in front of the home fans, to watch him jump into the glass, it was a moment that you'll never forget. You know, that's uh, such a momentum boost and at a key time, too. Everybody is out of their seat. There's momentum. There's belief going on here. 
they got six players over the age of 35, and you know the Penguins uh, fed off of that, and the, their young legs took over in Game Four. gave us the, the confidence we needed. It said a lot about the character of the team, and yeah, it probably did send a subtle message to Detroit that, hey, we're not going away that easy. I felt better before game five than I felt of any Penguin game in the whole playoffs. I like to read the body language of our players. I saw the look in the eyes, I saw the fire in the belly. Uh, everything looked like it was gonna line up for us to possibly bring this baby home to win it in game number six. The Penguins were determined to keep up their winning ways, but Detroit was back on home ice and new reinforcements were on the way. The big story for the Detroit Red Wings, Pavel Datsuk, who has missed the last seven games, is going to be in the lineup tonight. How much can he add? Uh, you know he's not 100%, but most players aren't at this particular time. The 18 days off will have had an effect, yes. But if he's got the puck at all, he certainly makes his Detroit team a better team. Despite the return of one of Detroit's top guns, the Penguins were flying right from the start. Everything seemed to be going our way early in that game. We had a great shift by the Evgeny Malkin line. And then we got a power play. And there's the first penalty in the game. It'll go against Detroit. Pittsburgh's power play has been excellent. They'll get the first chance in this game. And I remember looking over to my radio partner, Mike Lane, going, what is going on here? We had a great start to that game, and, uh, you know, we kind of just lost it. All of a sudden, we were on our heels, and the veteran wings just seized that moment, and they took over. And the Datsuk has clearly went in game of turn the shot. The Penguins felt that they had all the momentum. There was this excitement about go to Detroit, win there, and then come back and celebrate the cup in front of the fans. I mean, that was the perfect ending to the story. It was. And uh, all of a sudden... See that one coming. That's like getting blindsided by a Mike Tyson punch. Game five was a total, you know, a game that never happens. You know, it was just uh, basically a washout for us. We didn't even think about it. On the brink of elimination, with their cup dreams crumbling, the Penguins got an inspirational lift from Mario Lemieux. Walking off the ice after game five, he was there outside our locker room and he just still had a, you know, a calm look on his face, a positive look. He's like just shaking his head. He's like, it's all right, boys. You shake this one off. It's one game. To have Mario around after that game when you're frustrated, when you're disappointed, when you're wondering if you just let the series get away, it boosts you. You know, you puff up and you're ready to go and you want to lay it on the line. Lemieux wasn't the only calming influence. One veteran in particular kept them cool under the pressure they faced. Billy did a great job, uh, especially that 
we have a really young team, and uh, he's in the room, and he's probably the guy who uh, makes the most joke. We're the gum chewers. I know, I know. First of all, we have a lot of guys who shouldn't be chewing gum and doing something else at the same time. He's the one who make everyone like feel really comfortable around him. He's like someone that you want to be around. Usually, you could tell a big difference in the plane when the guys are down. But with leaders like Bill Guerin, after that game, it felt like we we lost two one or three one. It it was not that bad for us, and we knew we we're gonna take the next game. Hey hey hey, let other guys go. Settle down. I think that was one of the one, one of the strengths of the team. It was always a pretty loose atmosphere. Some people from the outside would kind of question it, but uh, guys were loose and uh, having fun. And at the same time, uh, guys were still really focused. The Stanley Cup is in the house. These Pittsburgh Penguins remember all too well the feeling of watching the Red Wings celebrate in this building a year ago, and they're going to do everything they can to force a game seven. Last year, I thought we were pretty uptight and, you know, game six, but this year, you kind of feel we were really loose and we knew we had to do and we were excited for the challenge. Well, the phrase is facing elimination. What is Pittsburgh thinking? For the Penguins, think about winning one game. They want to get the lead, and I think Marc-Andre Fleury will bounce back after getting pulled back in game five. The pressure intensified as the teams traded scoring chances. And early in the second period, the Penguins finally drew first blood. Wimbledon couldn't hold it in. Here's Stahl. He's got Cook with a Stahl with a shot. Save made. Rebound. Score! George Stahl got his own rebound. 51 seconds into the second period. It's 1-0 Pittsburgh. Despite a frantic battle for control of the game, the score remained the same heading into the third period. We talked about Fleury having to have a good game. He's been good, but he could certainly use another goal or two. Now the puck goes to Kennedy behind the net. Both the way by Austin. Rebound. Score! Tyler Kennedy picked up the puck, and the Penguins have a 2-0 lead. Go now. Go. This is right here. Get traffic and shot. Over to Erickson. And a flat save me. Rebound. Score! To Detroit desperately unloaded everything they had, but Pittsburgh weathered the storm in a valiant last stand. Out to the line, more pick, but it's taken away. Dad took a flip half behind everybody. He's clearing. some huge saves for us. Uh, we knew if we could get through that game, anything can happen in game seven. He was his best when he needed to be his best. That's it. Puts on the brakes. It's knocked off his stick. Recovered by Hosa. Hosa, long shot. Picked up by Dodson. Tittery pass. Backhanded in front. Skidari is down. Who's got that puck covered? What a play by Rob Skidari. Unbelievable play by Skidari. He's the, the piece. <laughs> He's the piece. He's the piece we needed. And you know what? That... Play right there was incredible. Scott's is just one of those guys who, who flies under the radar most times, but you can't win without guys like that. Calvin Hill gets the throw, attempt to center ice, and that's going to do it. We're going to have a game seven in the 2009 Stanley Cup final. Sid, for the second straight year, the Stanley Cup was out of its box, and you guys made him put it back in. How satisfying is it knowing that the next time it comes out of there, you actually have a chance to touch it? No, it's uh, it's an unbelievable opportunity, and um, you know we weren't thinking about last year at all. But um, you know we found a way to survive. That's what we had to do tonight, and now it's uh, it's anyone's game. The morning of the biggest game of their lives, the Penguins awoke to more inspiring words from Mario. Before Game Seven, he he sent a text that said, "We just have to play without fear." This is what you've been dreaming of your whole lives. Go out there and get it, and uh, I'll see you at center ice. When we got that text message, we were ready to run through a wall after reading that. That uh, sends chills down your spine. Toss out all the statistics. Forget about all the previous games. None of it matters anymore except this one game. You try to tell yourself it's just another game. Obviously, that's, uh, that's not going to work. Many of the hockey athletes you'll see tonight began playing at age four or five. And as kids, they would pretend. Stanley Cup Final, Game 7, the puck's on my stick. No pretending tonight. 
going back to Detroit, they had the experience of winning it. They went through it already. They won it. They, they knew how to do it. You would look at this Detroit team and say, geez, this is a team that's unbeatable on home ice. They've only lost one game in the playoffs, and that was in triple overtime. Outside of the room, I don't think uh, a lot of people will give us a lot of chance to win it. Centerberg and Crosby, they are the two that will meet at center ice here to get things started. And Pittsburgh not with the kind of first shift they wanted to try with London and Light. Centerberg quick, he's got a rebound of Tam. Tyler got Sue Cockater. Fury stopped that. A little bit of nerves there. You just got so many thoughts running through your head. So 90 eventful seconds for Detroit to start. Get a couple shifts in, um, and, and then you're fine. And Pittsburgh has seemed to settle down a little bit. Cosby walks out, passes to Malkin. Oh, but skipped over top of his stick. We focused on just playing our game and, you know, to make sure that you're intense and, and not watching. While the Penguins peppered Osgood at one end, Fleury kept the game scoreless at the other. end to a fast-paced first period and there's still no score in the second period pittsburgh's forecheck stepped up its assault on detroit's defense now stewart now the tries to tie him up kind of a weird little play coming out of the corner gino did a great turnover on the forecheck I just figured I would try to open his leg and, and shoot it. I didn't see go it in. I didn't see where my shot went. Five hole far side. I don't know. All I know is it went in the net. There's that aggressive four check that defines this Pittsburgh team. And that goal was huge. And Pittsburgh gets that all important first goal. Detroit plays a little different uh, when they have the lead. To play with the lead was giant because uh, it's it's tough to come back. Fleury remained strong, and momentum shifted in Pittsburgh's direction until they were stung with a blow that threatened to shatter their dream. Crosby wraps up with Franza. And Crosby, hunched over, apparently hurt on this play, and he will try to get to the bench. My knee got caught when, when he hit me and just kind of got my side of the leg stuck on the boards. He was definitely struggling just to get off the ice. Crosby really hurting at the bench. They're helping him back towards the locker room. I knew it was, it was pretty bad. We knew Sid was probably done for the game. With their captain hurt, it was time for Pittsburgh's Mr. Clutch to step into the spotlight again. We call him the gamer. Comes Talbot back again. With Kennedy over the right side, Talbot shoots. He scores! Max Talbot beats goaltender Osgood like a rented mule. He knew going in there was going to be a storyline that maybe wasn't the one you expected. Talbot's got two. But at this point now, with Max, maybe you need to expect him. He's a big game player, that kid. He loves the spotlight. He loves cameras. I guess I guess I can say he craves attention. So I, I think that's why he does so well in those games. An absolute perfectly placed shot up and over the elbow of Chris Osgood. I never celebrate for goals because I'm always surprised that I score goals. But when I scored that second one, I had the time to do a little celebration on my knees. I don't uh, show in a lot of emotion on the bench, but I'm sure I broke a smile when that thing hit the twine. The gamer. <laughs> With a two-goal lead going into the second intermission, Pittsburgh's attention turned to Crosby. We saw Sid in the locker room as his gear was still on, and he was walking around, stretching it out, trying to see if he'd be able to go. I went in the room there for, for the second, and... Um, Tried to numb it as much as I could, but I still couldn't really skate. You see him put his jersey on. He's been our leader from day one, and that's uh, you know that that's the type of guy he is. He he wanted to lead us even in that situation. He probably carry us uh, the whole season, the whole playoffs. So it was at least like this little thing that we can do for him. The third period of Game Seven from Detroit is underway with Pittsburgh leading two to nothing. I mean, I thought we played defensively so well the first couple of periods, and it, it kind of seemed like a different team we were playing against in the third period. The Red Wings kept coming and kept kept pressing the issue. Jammed it back through Bill Blood of Lindstrom. Sends it across for a shot. It was a 
one timer from Blue Line was a great, uh, great shot. The defending champions aren't dead yet. They got the one goal that they needed. I mean, then anything can happen. We got to pucker up now and just get everything deep and you know try to hold them off for six more minutes. Five and a half anxious minutes to go in the third period. You're always told and you always try and tell yourself not to watch the clock in those situations, but you can't help but do it. It seemed every single second it was taking forever to come off that clock. You know, you're taking deep breaths, you're squeezing the stuffing out of yourself in that suit. The last few minutes felt like an eternity. You know, this is it, this is the final push. The clock just continues to turn. Three and a half remaining, under three minutes to go. There's Nicholas Cornwall, shoots and he hit the cross bar. You don't know if it's going to be a ding and a cheer. The thought went through my mind that I hope that didn't go in the net. And a close call, it was almost 2-2. That was uh, nice to hear nothing after. Detroit's blitz continued into the final moments. The most nervous I think I've ever been was the last seconds of that period. 6.5 seconds remaining, and the Red Wings had one last miracle left. I wanted to start smiling and celebrating, but you couldn't. You could see the net was open. You could see it was Lidstrom. You were hoping the clock was going to expire before he gets the shot off. Just like suspended animation, you can kind of feel everybody hold their breath on the bench. I just said, no way. No way. Please, Lauer, please, Lauer, get across. What an incredible save, you know, against one of the best defensemen ever. They've done it! The Penguins have done it! And you can finally give one last look up at the clock and you see the zeros. I'm on the ice and I'm just throwing my gloves as high as I can. The Penguins have won the Stanley Cup and Lord Stanley scratched their names on your fabled cup. All right, now we can go nuts. It's, it's time to celebrate. We did it. Thanks for everything, eh? Thanks for pushing me the whole way, eh? Oh, what a game! You must be dead! Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Game 7, it's not a good final. I used to score the game winner before, but, uh, you know, I'll take the win. You know, we won the Cup. That's the best day of my life. Well, it's almost storybook, I mean, to write it, where you come back to the finals and beat the defending champions in their home building in Game 7. I don't pen stories like that. Great, great. Enjoy it, eh? That's great leadership by you. Okay. I, I do, I do. I say it kind of my mom and dad. I'm so happy. Waiting all those years to just have the opportunity and then finally winning it, it was just amazing. Just to share that moment with all the teammates, too, was just something really special for everybody. I felt like it was me in the cup and my, and my boys and my teammates. Boys that are hot, <laughs> day in and day out. <laughs> the fat sacrifice of these guys coming together, each guy playing a part of it, each guy's struggle to make their statement uh, to everybody, saying we, we actually did bring the cup to Pittsburgh. We win as a team, we lose as a team. I just told the guys that uh, we're going back to Pittsburgh, we're going to win game six and win the cup here on Friday, which we did. Who would have thought in February, you know, 10th place, we would have been even remotely close to, to lifting the cup this year. This makes you want to have it more. I mean, having gone through this and, and share this with guys, you want it again. Out. They're so deserving, and um, the way that things have gone for this team too over the last, you know, years, it's it's had some ups and downs, and you know they've been really loyal, and I think uh, you know having gone through what we did last year. Um, we were so close and we really wanted to get it back 
That's a great sports town. They're, uh, they're well deserving. The cops had to come and get us last night because the, the, the cop was in the, we were in a, uh, a local establishment and then the people flooded the streets outside. The parade was uh, unbelievable. Um, everyone was uh, in the street and I think everyone like loves hockey and they love the fact that they are like family for us and uh, they always cheer for us even if we don't play good. I like the comment that Fleury did on the microphone on the stage over there. He said that even if I have soft hands sometimes, uh, he said, you, you, you still like cheer for me. They told us there was maybe 400,000 people out there. To me, it looked like there was a million. There was people everywhere. And uh, you know, this is a city champion. They're used to do this. You know, they did this for the Steelers. They did it for us now. And they're, they're, thrilled. they're truly the best fans out there. To see the joy in their faces and the passion they have for their team and boy that was really great and um, I'm so glad that we won this but so glad we won it for the city of Pittsburgh and those fans it was great well I don't think I uh, I sat in the pickup for more than two minutes I ran the whole parade and uh, I was lucky enough to be with Billy Garen in the in our pickup which I think we kind of have the same personality we, we want to share that with the fans and we were running and giving high fives and uh, the crowd was unbelievable, but uh, I was with my dad and my parents and my brothers, and they were running with me. My dad just, you know, he thought he was the coolest man on earth, you know, walking around in the parade. And you know what? That's that's why we play. We play to sh share that th these moments. That that's why we play.